All right, Jessica, you're set to present. Yes. Um, I can't see IRC, so if people add themselves to the queue, Christine, can you can you let me know? Yes. Okay. I will I will start then. Um, so uh, this is the worldview we're looking at here, which is we have Alice, uh, an object on machine A, and we have Bob, uh, an object on machine B, Carol, an object on machine C, and Alice has already a reference to Carol that's on uh, machine C, and Alice also has a reference to Bob. Um, there are numerous things to note here. One is that there are import and export tables for each session. And this little um, goodie bag, or whatever you want to call it, is uh, a gift table. It's where gifts can be deposited. Uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that each side of these sessions and each session have their own gift table. Um, so you can see here's A's in the A to B, here's B in the A to B, C's in the A to C, and uh, A's in A to C. Um, and then there are these connections are, are imported and exported at, at the import and up export tables, and this is number. This denotes the number on the that it's imported in and exported in. Uh, so this is. 12, uh, and this is 56. They're just picked at random. Uh, so as I said, um, each session has um, certain attributes. And these are, the, these are for each, um, so like I said, each session. So there's a session ID, which is both of the public keys sorted and then hashed. So it's the same on each side. Uh, the key pair, so each. Uh, session has uh, a key pair in individual to the machine uh, and the session, uh, the import and export table as, um, and the gift table as, as shown. So we want to do a handoff. So in this case, Bob is, this is just a method name in, in Goblins and, and the arrow here is the send message operation. So it's sending the reference um, to, Bo uh, sending to Bob uh, the method, say hello, uh, and, and the reference is Carol, which, of course, uh, Bob here does not have the, the a reference to Carol. So a handoff will occur. Um, there's some terminology to go over first, um, and you can see the di diagram here as I go through them. There is a gifter, which is the person receiving, sorry, the person giving the handoff. In this case, it would be uh, machine A. The receiver is the person getting the reference. Uh, in this case, it's machine B. And the exporter, which is the location of the gift. In this case, machine C. Um, there is a slight complication to this in that uh, the exporter can, it doesn't actually have to be the sort of home or location where the object lives. It could be technically a promise um, or something else, but in this simple situation, it's it's is where Carol lives, and the mechanics of the handoff don't actually change. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so the first thing that happens when Alice, oh, sorry, Machine A tries to give, uh, tries to perform the handoff um, to Machine B, is uh, machine A sends a message, and this message is depositing in the gift table for A to C. Um, so this is on C, the side of C. It's the it's the gift table between the sessions A and C, and it's being sent um, to the Bootstrap object on C with the method deposit gift, and it has a gift ID. Um, and then the reference to Carol. This on the wire ends up being a deliver only operation. Uh, the bootstrap reference is always at position zero. Uh, the, the method is just the first argument. There's nothing special about methods uh, in Goblins. Uh, 25 is the gift ID. We'll soon see 
how this comes into effect. And here is just um, the, uh, the the integer that is, um, you can see it here, the 56. Yes. Um, and the, so this is just Carol. This is the reference to Carol. Um, something worth noting is what happens first is A sends it, but C might not necessarily receive this. Uh, it's just being sent by Alice. And the reason this is first is um, machine A needs the gift ID to perform the next step. The next step is sending a certificate shown by this bit of clip art um, from A uh, to machine B so that Bob gets this reference. Um, now let's look at the certificate. Um, this certificate in uh, CAPTP is given by this handoff give. This is this is a certificate object. And then uh, there is a re the recipient key. And it's quite important to re remember which key is which. So this is B's public key in the A to B um, session. Uh, and we'll see soon see why this is useful um, to be to be the B's key in the A to B session. We also have the exporter location, which is so that if C, uh, B does not know, uh, sorry, if B doesn't have a connection to C, it knows where to look up C uh, to create a connection. It's the session ID uh, for the A to C session. And then uh, the gift aside is the one gifting. So it's A's public key in the A to C session. To specify that you know it, it's A that's gifting and sees the export, uh, exporter. And then this gift ID is that 25 we saw when A deposit, uh, sent that deposit message um, before to C. So this is, um, it's a bit more useful to see with some quasi real data. Uh, the handoff give, uh, this is the key. This is a OCAP and URI. Um, this is the session name, the, the key, and then the 25. Now importantly, uh, a bit that wasn't covered on the last slide, is this uh, is a signature. Um, made by A using A's A to C key, not A to B key. Uh, and this will be useful later, but I will just quickly say this is so that C, when C gets this, C will eventually get this. This is so C is able to verify A actually sent this, uh, made this certificate. Um, so this is what the certificate looks like on the wire. Um, and so B gets the certificate. And what does B do with that? Um, the first thing B does with this is make a promise, which will, if everything goes to plan, eventually resolve to the reference of Carol on C. Uh, and B delivers this message, this say hello message, to Bob with the promise, unresolved promise. Um, uh, and that's the first thing. And, and this green dotted line is uh, a, prom a promise that hopefully will resolve, but might break. Um, the other things B does with this is uh, if it doesn't have a connection to C, it establishes one and does all of the machinery that normally occurs when uh, a session is established, such as generating the keys, the session IDs, et cetera, et cetera, grabbing the bootstrap object. Um, and then B makes this handoff receive, which we're going to look at in a second. And this includes that certificate we've just seen. And it sends this handoff receive to machine C's bootstrap object. Uh, and this diagram is showing machine B sending this to machine C. And you can see here that uh, it contains the certificate. So what, what's in this? Um, it's 
the receiving session. This is the session ID in the B to C session. Uh, the receiving side, which in this case, B is the receiver. Uh, and so it's B's key in the B to C session. The handoff count is just an integer, um, which is used to prevent replay attacks. Uh, if you could imagine that if this is on a blockchain or if this is uh, being eavesdropped on, uh, someone could just grab this handoff receive message and to prevent them just replaying it, we've got an integer to prevent that replay attack. And then the signed give is the certificate that we've just seen. So starting to look maybe a little scary, at least it was for me when I first saw this, but um, we've already gone through a lot of it. So this uh, here, uh, we've already gone through it. It's the same uh, certificate we saw before. And this is the handoff receive extra information that B's adding on so that C is able to do all of the checks and balances necessary to go ahead and perform the handoff. Uh, so you can see this handoff count is just an integer. This suggests it's the fourth one that's happening, but it doesn't have to, it's, so long as it's not been used before. Um, uh, and these are just representing the keys. Uh, again, the crucial thing to note in this slide um, is that the signature here is the signature by B, so using B's key in the A to B um, session. So what does C do when it gets this certificate? Because now we're at the point where C has the certificate that, uh, sorry, not only the certificate, but the handoff receive. C has that. What does C do with it? Well, it pulls out the A to C session name and looks up, do I have a session between A to C? And if so, let me get those gift tables and export tables and keys um, and start looking at them. And uh, over here to help show, because uh, it can be a little tricky to remember whose key, which side, uh, this is a diagram. Uh, it checks the si signature on the certificate, the handoff GIF. Um, and it knows the key pair because it was signed with a A's key to A to C. So it can look up the um, key pair and verify that this actually was signed by the A that C knows, the A in the Alice and Carol machine A to machine B, sorry, machine C uh, session. And that also means, of course, that uh, the data here is indeed the, the data that C, uh, sorry, that machine A uh, created. Um, and then it checks this, so signature on the um, handoff receive. Um, this was made by the uh, by B uh, using B's private key in the A to B session. So remember the diagram. This is this is this session, A to B, and of course C isn't normally aware of this session at all. But A helpfully for C included the public key for uh, B in the B to A, uh, in the A to B session. So uh, C can go grab that key and verify that B really is the B A thinks B is, um, and, and that B really did say all of this stuff. And so at this point, we're able to deduce quite a bit that this was indeed written by A, that um, C knows A to C is in this relationship. Uh, and C is able to know that this isn't some malicious person that saw the certificate on the wire and uh, pretended to be B. Uh, it's not some mallet on, on D. They wouldn't have the key pair for the A to, uh, A to B session. So we know that this really is B that's sending the handoff receive. And so C can, with, some, with good confidence, go look up the gift ID in the A to C 
uh, session if it exists. Um, and of course, if it doesn't exist, perhaps this uh, A to C connection is really slow and this is somehow really quick. Really quick. Um, all that happens is a promise is set up here that resolves when the gift comes in. Um, and so that the what, what B will get back is um, either a ref, reference to Carol that was deposited in the gift table, deposited in that goodie bag, or it has a promise that should eventually resolve to Carol. Um, so again, this is going over exactly what C can check. I won't go over it again. Um, but it knows also that it's not being replayed, like I said, uh, using that um, the, the uh, hand, uh, handoff count. So what does C do with this? It gets the gift ID um, from the table uh, and exports this to B. And then once B has it, uh, B now has this reference and it's exported to Bob. And finally, B, B fulfills that promise that it gave to the actor Bob. And if Bob has used, uh, sent messages to Carol or whatever, those will then flow th through and, and Bob has the reference to Carol. So that's how handoffs work. Um, I don't know if people have questions. Uh, I went through this fairly quickly, but I'm willing, uh, you know, obviously I can go back to slides and. and what so this. This seems pretty similar to what is sort of spec'd out in the cap proto schema, with the exception that like a lot of the crypto bits are just sort of left abstract and net layer specific in the in the cap and proto schema. Mm -hmm. so that's I this this is useful in that it kind of gives me a, a, a sense of like what to keep an eye on for compatibility. I do have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned so. Um, the the scenario where Bob, um, where the the message from B to C comes in before the the uh, the message from A to C, um, such that machine C hasn't seen that it's supposed to provide a gift, it returns a promise. Um, mm -hmm. The way that works in Captain Proto, I think there's it. Um, I think the way that ends up working in Captain Proto is just the message that machine b sends will eventually get a return just like with a call and it will just base just like it's a it's a question that you're you can pipeline stuff on it but it won't return until that's resolved is i think mm -hmm. how that works so i don't know if, it's not really a question i'm just sort of noticing what sounds like a difference um yeah i don't know it it sounds quite similar. You can promise pipeline on on that reference that Carol, uh, sorry, machine C would give you, yeah. um, and basically that would be resolved. Um, it's my where's my mouse at? So this part would be resolved, but there would be a promise within machine C that would um, have all the messages queued up, uh, mm -hmm. and then um, when when this this uh, gift delivery comes in, it will, the, the promise will be listening on that and it will fulfill that promise and then later shortening would occur to to make it, it a direct reference. But yeah, yeah see, it sounds see, similar. See, uh, um, yeah. Jessica's right, the, the, the promise pipelining, you, since it is a message sent from B to C uh, during the deposit gift and you're literally just getting from that arrow that was much earlier um, to the, you know, handoff receive or, um, <clears throat> what what you can literally promise pipeline on it and um i think that in the way that we have things designed um it simply won't end up you won't end up getting anything like when it when c ends up saying okay i'm i'm setting up a promise for that that's mostly c's internal machinery noting that okay. because uh, when when the promise is eventually fulfilled um like you know there could be multiple promises that are kind of being intermittently changed locally on c okay so that um, is the same yeah yeah yeah. um that was that was the bit that was a little confusing is i think i i maybe i even misheard it sounded like there was actually like a promise it there's a promise internally in c and i think that the main thing it's, was it's just that, thing, the, not, yeah that, like, that it was trying to be able to explain mentally how these things connect 
Okay, so I think that's exactly the same then. Great. Um, I guess, so one thing I have been thinking about is negotiating different ways to connect to machines. Um, because I'm like, I'm, I'm envisioning what we're going to end up with a scenario where like maybe some machine wants to be a Tor hidden service and another one is like running in a browser and can speak WebRTC and web sockets. And that's the only way it has to connect to, connect to anything. Um, so I, I noticed you, you just have an OCAPN URL in there. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, sort of tweaking that to be a, a more structured form? Because the URLs, that seems like something that probably if we have that syntax at all, it probably should get parsed into a structured data before it hits messages. It, it is parsed um, into a structured data. It's not actually a string. That that was just okay. So this is this isn't the literal mess. This isn't the literal form of the messages. This is just high level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, Jessica. I, I spoke for. I, I I should let you you answer, but you can answer about the net layer stuff if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? The, the, how does it handle if there are multiple net? Layers. Um, I, I, yeah. I, maybe Christine's better at that. I'm okay, not sure I, what would I, happen. Why in the don't way. I respond? So first of all, the string representation here was just to, for simplicity. We do have an on the wire right. representation of a OCAP and machine that's destructured okay. and everything like that. But it's hard to see that when you basically have all these extra record type things. So this is this okay, is much yeah. easier to follow. Um, there is a PR, uh, not a PR, uh, a issue open about the OCAP and URI structure, which is the way that we are currently doing things internally. What you don't see here is you see OCAP and colon slash slash machine dash C, and then it's got dot foo. Dot foo is, at, the foo is actually the net layer. So you okay. you would actually, you can, so like in our case uh, that we've done, it's dot onion typically. And, um, but you could do, you know, dot, you know, let's say S WebRTC, where S means some form of figuring out how to make it secure for our mechanisms, right? Um, so those net, so so some to some degree, I think that that conversation is dependent on the kind of the net layers presentation. This presentation that we went into right now, if you didn't have the urgency, you specifically, Ian, of needing to be able to do with this right now, this would have been like presentation four, not presentation yeah. one. Right? Um, right, because there's yeah. a whole bunch of things that were not explained ahead of time of imports and exports, how questions and answers are done, and stuff like that. Um, but this is, you know, trying to trying to address your urgent need. Yeah, so I'm kind of, we're kind of leaning on those are hopefully similar enough that I don't need a presentation to understand this, and I think that's true. Um, so the other just one design thing I want to keep in mind for third-party handoffs, I want to do this in such a way that when we have a bridge setup if say um suppose machine a is a an ocap n machine and machine c and b both speak both that and cat and proto but would prefer to talk cat and proto directly to one another i'd like to see if we can do this in a way such that they can both discover that that preference and connect directly um i think i can see ways to do that but that's just something i wanted to put on people's radar um it seems like especially if we have the ability to like offer multiple um connection options we could just have like here's a list of preferences and oh okay that one's via cat and proto whatever um yeah it's just a thought it's not a like question that needs i think specific answering or anything i have a high level question that if someone's in a position to answer would certainly uh, help me out, but understandably nobody might be able to be in a position to answer this. I do not know Captain Pro Captain Proto in detail. Uh, as I'm hearing this presentation, by the way, my apologies also for joining late. I didn't join until 12:15. Um, the uh, I hear a lot of the same terminology as the terminology in the CAPTP that was done for the E language, um, uh, the the gifts and the handoff tables and all this. Uh, if you're familiar enough, I mean, that. so the similarity in terminology might be because of the similarity in terminology between uh, CAPTP for E versus CAP and Proto. But in case you're familiar enough with the precise CAPTP for E, uh, I would uh, love to hear what are the semantic differences between this and that 
Uh, other than the obvious difference between a certificate-based protocol and a live connection-based protocol. Yeah, I am not that familiar with the e-terminology for a lot of these message types. I've like looked at some of the point-to-point -point related messages in response to other discussions, but I can't actually remember what they're called in e. I think the CAM proto terminology is quite different than this. I think we call the a to b a to c message provide and the the b to c message accept um yeah like a lot of the captain proto names for things are quite different than the e names okay, so, yeah so i'm not so i'm not actually concerned about naming differences i just wanted to know if anybody was familiar enough with both worlds that they could point out what the semantic differences are so hi mark I can jump in a little bit. So first of all, um, glad you made it to the call, Mark. I'm very relieved you made it for part of this. And for the part you didn't, we did record. So you will be able to review the first few minutes of it. Um, there's, I think the differences between Cap and Proto and, uh, and this system are still the ones that we have talked about previously as in terms of kind of the um, to IDL or not to IDL thing. Most of the other things are extremely similar. When designing... The stuff for our system, I studied three documents, which was, you know, E's documentation, uh, Cap and Proto's documentation, and uh, the Agoric. I went line by line, and if you might remember, I added comments to yeah. Agoric's CapTP implementation. So um, okay. I actually think that there are there are very similar structural differences without aside from the IDL thing. Um, or sorry, very similar structural uh, similarities, not differences. Uh, okay. So. so so, the, the, so Agoric has only at this point uh, implemented and in fact only really designed um, the point-to-point, -point, the two-party system. Uh, I'm hearing a lot here about the three-party. And by the way, the ECAPTP also used provide for and accept from. Yeah, um, so. Two sides. So, um, so, uh, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly... Um, relaxed about whether there are um, uh, s uh, mysterious semantic changes with regard to the two-party interaction, and I'm wondering if anybody uh, has has is is understands the semantics created by the protocol for the three-party interaction well enough to correct me if I'm wrong, Ian. But the three-party handoff was never implemented in in Cap and Proto yet. It was spec'd out, but not implemented. Right, and that's that's why we're doing this presentation now. No one, none of the implementations support it. There's documentation for it in RPC.CAPMP, but because it doesn't actually have any implementations yet, yet I figured there is okay. some flexibility to tweak the design there where there isn't in point-to-point okay. -point stuff. But I have a client that wants me to implement it for Go, Cap, and Proto. I have a few things. Uh, in the queue ahead of that, but so that window of opportunity is going to close soon as I actually implement this and it gets deployed. Okay, um, so, so that's why I wanted this presentation now. Okay, so just I want to point out that uh, Agoric hasn't implemented it. You, ju you just said that Cap and Proto hasn't implemented it. The eCapTP did implement it. It's been in, it was in use for years. It's rather robust um, uh, and. Uh, um, the only other one that I, the only other thing in the in the CapTP family that I know did implement the three-party handoff uh, is Midori, which it never got open source. So I, I uh, so in, so I do encourage that we should really uh, compare this in some detail when we can uh, with what E did because it is a working three-party handoff protocol. There, there, there. Yes, I, I think that that would be a great thing to reconcile, Mark. And this uh, this presentation was accelerated far beyond before we were quite anticipating it, uh, as said. Um, but I actually, I wanted to say a couple things, first of all. Uh, Jessica, congratulations. I think this presentation was awesome. I'm going to do a round of applause here. Um, uh, uh, and, and also, I wanted to ask Mark, given all of your background in this, um, whenever I hear you go over these things and you don't raise a bunch of issues. I assume things are going pretty well. So what did you think of um, having having overviewed this, uh, having come into the meeting and seen, seen what was presented here? Well, I, so I'm really, really sorry I was late. 
um, with having missed the first 15 minutes, I could spot many similarities, but I have no confidence that if there were differences that I would have had something to say about, I have no confidence that I would have spotted them. Okay. So why don't, why don't I send you the recording as soon as possible, and we can see whether or not there's anything within the first few minutes that would be there. But actually, Jessica, could you jump straight to the beginning real quick? Yeah, um, absolutely. Actually, um, I, what I want to do is so... get to the part which has to do with the handoff tables. Um, yeah, so uh, it's this one, right? Yes. So, um, and go back actually uh, right to the beginning, and then let's jump forward to this because I just want to ha have Mark see what's happening okay. here. So, um, do you want do you want me to go through for like a few minutes and just quickly do the first bit again? Um, I want to give an accelerated version of this, so it's up to you whether or not okay. you want to do it or or if I should do it. Your choice. You can do it and just say next slide when you want me to. Okay. All right, <laughs> Mark. Just just for catching you up. Um, what, um, the, the tags that are appearing on the end of the wire, I know not how you would normally do it, the, um, are representing the uh, import and export uh, um, pairwise integers. Okay. Um, the... uh, wait, uh, hold on, the, the, the one labeled 56? Mm -hmm. Oh no, it's, it's right, okay, good, 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 yes. Yeah, the handbags represent a uh, handoff table that's and so each side has a, a a handoff table for incoming for their direction, right? That they're storing things in. Um, so there's you know um, e, e, on each yeah on each pairwise session there's there's two of them. So now um, if you move yeah, forward, let, 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 sorry, let, let me let me just make sure the 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 handbag in the left next to the fifty six. Mm -hmm. That's Carol's table of things that Alice is giving to Bob, or just Carol's table of things that Alice is giving to someone. It's so this is a little bit different from how you handled things. I think um, I, I'm not completely sure it is a between. So there are sessions set up between A and B and A and C and in the future B and C. Right. Um, so yeah, each yeah. one of those pairwise sessions, um, each machine generates a key for its own respective side of that specific session. The um and uh and and those keys are actually used to identify the session they're they're sorted and then hashed and then that's a unique session name um okay. so the um so the what what you're what you're seeing here is that there will be between a and c a will say um i this is for between you and me between a and c these are the handoffs that i'm giving to somebody but it doesn't say to who um, it does not say to who. Okay. Right, but the certificates enforce and encode that. Um, so if we step forward now, uh, so Jessica, step forward um, again and next. Um, so uh, um, so here the terminology we're using is gifter for who, um, which would be A. Receiver is B, and exporter is C. Um, and I know I know there are other terms, but the, this is kind of what I was doing when when I was initially designing this handoff nope. thing. And so those uh, those terms are good. Okay, good. Um, all right, uh, next, Jessica. Um, so this is the part that you'd be thinking about, right? Um, so yeah. A is depositing the gift on C. Now it is for B, but it does not say that. It just says so. The arrow says to the C bootstrap reference. We're going to invoke to the bootstrap object. The deposit gift method, say we're depositing it at index 25, and I want to deposit the Carol reference I have. Um, so, and then you can see the on the wire representation of what that gets translated into in CAPTV, but it's not super important. Um, this, the table itself is inside machine C, correct? That's correct. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Now, if you move forward, Jessica, um, so that. Um, a also sends a certificate to B, and of course, the same way that you would say in your own presentations, these two operations are happening, you know, quasi simultaneously with no yeah. concern as in terms of races, right? Uh, now move right. forward. Um, um, so here's the certificate for the handoff give. Um, it's got the recipient key, which is B's key in A to B. It's got the exporter location, so that you so that B knows where to connect. The session is specifically between A and C. So that's a session where the gift table is going to exist that's going to be looked up here. Um, these This gifter side is here for robustness. You could infer it, but we just do an extra check. Um, and then the ID is the um, 
is the would be twenty five in this case. So if you move forward, Jessica, can, um, can't wait before you move before you move forward. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Um, yeah. Does that have to be the key in in a B's key in A to B, or can it be a key just for this handoff? It's a key in A to C. Um, and it oh, is recipient key. Oh, you the recipient the key recipient. is A to is A to B. It is. Um, so it you would ha this prevents having to negotiate new keys all the time. In the session mm -hmm. between A and B, there is a key that is made specifically. It's not B's key. It is B's key between A and B, and right. um, and 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 it is specifically that way. You don't do, need to do a coordination every time for the next handoff. A can just start generating the thing to hand it to B. Right. I understand. I understand. But there's a correlation risk then with A handing to C and D and using the same key. We're not considering a correlation attack in this particular scenario. OK, it's out of scope. Um, OK, could be considered. But just saying within this particular design, it's not considered. All right. So next one. Um, uh, so here is what it would actually look like with the information filled in. Um, you've got uh, um, the handoff give, and then it's got this outer signature. But right, the the it's typed with handoff give. Um, the um, and then you've got the we're going to give it to B in the A to B session. There's um, this is actually destructured. It's not a string. It's just for convenience that you see it here. Here's how you get to the machine. Here's the session specifically that the that the thing is related to. And so you can see this is just the same thing as a previous slide, but just with the actual data in place. Um, so now go, move forward, Jessica. Um, I, uh, and so this, the green arrow, Jessica set up as the, assuming the promise that will eventually exist in the future. Right. Um, and so move forward again, Jessica, um, uh, we'll just move forward one more time. Uh, the, okay. So this part, the outer envelope that you see here, this is between B and C that dashed line between B and C. That's the upper black one is actually representing it's really about B talking to C, but it's actually B talking to C's bootstrap object and saying, I'm going to deliver oh. this certificate. Um, and then it's just a normal, so move forward, Jessica. Um, it's a, um, it's got, uh, and that, the information here is mostly for robustness, except for the signed give. The, um, it's saying this is the B to C session. Um, this is the key. And here's an integer to say the number of handoffs. And those three things to combine prevent a replay attack. Um, as far as I can tell. Um, all right, move forward again, Jessica. Um, so here is the full thing together, right? Um, and so with this thing delivered, you know, the promise will be able to be fulfilled. And just as you say in your own presentations that you've given, um, you know, the messages can sit on the wire between, uh, can sit not before they go on the wire, right? The messages can sit, uh, uh, well, no, they can actually sit on the wire because they can be pipelined between B, B and C before the actual, in case that it takes longer but for the message to come between A and C, as soon as that's ready, then of course they can all be pipelined to the right recipient and they can get to Carol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, does this make sense having seen all that? Yeah, it makes sense. And I think that it's equivalent. Uh, let me check. This does not assume that there's any transmission of secrets. It, uh, the only secrets are the secret signing key. Right, which are held privately by each party okay. within their... Right. Yep. Okay. And uh, the someone else, not B, that receives the certificate that A gave to B cannot use it to claim the handoff. That's right, because you'll see... Yeah, this is... Yeah, so... It... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... There's this one, right? It's uh, B's key in the A to B session. Uh, A provided that. Uh, so um, in the in the initial certificate that's been signed with the A to C key. So C's already checked here. The certificate's valid um, in, in terms of the A to C relationship. Um, and then because it knows it's valid, it can take this B key, the B... B's public key in the A to B session, and it can then verify B's signature that it made for the handoff receive that it gave to C uh, to check that B really is the B A knows them to be. If someone sat on that wire between A and B and stole that and then sent it, 
um, they would not be able to forge that signature. Okay. Um, what 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 semantics of message order are you trying to achieve in general, even e even in the two party case? E order is provided, but one thing that's different between us and uh, and um, I guess E, and I know that you've been changing your some of your mind on some of these things, Mark, is that yeah. um, I don't advertise E order as being a thing, even though it exists. Um, because I'm sus I'm suspicious about whether or not it it, it providing the uh, things that to it, you developers in a in a way that's as intuitive as I think the e documentation claim that it gave. So it is provided, but what we do promise is um, between A and B and A and C, there are there are pairwise between machines uh, message order delivery. Um, okay, so you have, so you have point to point FIFO. Mm -hmm. uh, you think you have e-order, but you're not advertising it as a specified feature. You think it might just be a property of the implementation. That's right. Uh, so let me just infer from that, that if on deeper examination, the implementation happens to violate e-order, that would not violate the intended, the semantics that you intend. We would not end up spending uh, a long time filling out wiki pages about the wormhole op. Uh, in our particular case, probably. That's right. Yep. Yep. That, that was the thing that drove me nuts and caused me to back off of the order. Yep. Um, another, another question. Uh, do you deal with lost messages? The lost messages are, um, are, are an, an, the particular design that we have assume, assumes a sequential series of messages between two machines. And I know that, I know, Alan, all of your opinions about this and how it gets broken in reality and everything, and that's fine. Um, it's up to the net layer to um, give that guarantee of sequential ordering in whatever in whatever way that that is provided, right? So if you've got a TCP connection over Tor Onion services or, or over in T, D, like TLS and TCP, um, that, you know, it's, it's that stream. Right, and then, um, but as in terms of, but you could also do it other ways. This was intentionally, OCAPM was intentionally designed such that that message order could also be provided in other ways, such as if you had store and forward messages where things came in in different orders and stuff like that, you could attach integers and stuff like that that would say, here are the intended you know, order or delivery. But the particular, the layer of the CAPTP part of uh, OCAPM is assumed to have been given a stream of messages that have all where those concerns have already been dealt with. Okay, so I'm, I'm just saying that if a message was lost or delayed too long, I guess you could just break the promises, right? We can, uh, and in fact, we take. So um, I spent some time thinking about. We are sort of getting both ahead and behind ourselves because of the order in which this presentation was given, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> The um, if if we had done so earlier, when when I was putting together the stuff for OCAPN, I tried to reconcile two different needs at the same time. I imagined building a multiplayer real time game, kind of like what Electric Communities Habitat was, and building uh, a blockchain like what Agoric has, and supporting both of those systems, right? Um, and how would you support both? And one of the big decisions to make is how do you end up dealing with uh, a se session severage and breakage, right? Um, so in the case where you, if you get messages out of, like if somehow messages get out of order in a way that's un irreconcilable, like, you know, you you got a message and like now the history doesn't make sense. The, se the same thing I think to do would be to break the session and it would need to be reestablished. Um, I believe that, um, that so we, there, this is kind of a separate conversation but I believe that we are taking the approach such that you can, in theory, have net layers that both are um, uh, being uh, real time with assumed sessions break a lot. You know, they are, you know, fast and et cetera, you know, um, move fast and die young. And the uh, um, versus you can also have the long lived, you know, you've got a, a blockchain of ancient history on it and that is also supported. Um, but that is actually a conversation to have at a future time. It is not part of this particular presentation. I will just make that assertion, and we will examine it and ro uh, for its robustness at a future time. I mean, I, I will. So, 
I do want to put in there like the ability to semantically break a connection and break all the promises on it is actually important for avoiding denial of service stuff because otherwise just stuff builds up in the tables and you have no semantically sensible way of freeing memory. Yes, in Mark's, um, Mark Miller's dissertation, Mark provides a very good case for breaking sessions in the example of the um, the spreadsheet, if you might remember that, Mark. Uh, yeah, the, the spread. I don't, I don't actually. Okay, well, I'll tell you because I've probably read your dissertation more recently than you have. Uh, you have an example in there of a spreadsheet, and there is a cell that's being updated, but um, somebody has lost a connection to the the spreadsheet thing, and you say, "Well, what should happen?" And you say, "Well, the the best thing to do is actually it's perfectly sensible to break the connection between these two these two parties." And what instead is that you have some sort of sturdy ref where you can just reestablish the connection and just get all the information back to set it back up again. Um, and that was very convincing for me when I was trying to think about how I would do the real-time game type scenario, right? Yeah. I, know, I know Waterken has a very different perspective, but for me, yeah. that, that was very motivating. Yeah. So, good. So, good. I, don't, I didn't remember that it was a spreadsheet example, but, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and yes, that's the e-failure model um, uh, while avoiding the big mistake that I made in the e-failure model. And yeah, the going back and forth between the e-failure model and the Waterkin failure model is, is a very interesting debate. Um, but yeah, for general purpose use, I think starting with the e-failure model uh, with reconnectable sturdy refs, if you have those, um, uh, is, yeah. a, is a good thing to do. Yeah, and Captain Proto, as it stands, assumes this. So I think we're kind of locked into that model. Like so the C++ implementation has utilities for dealing with automatic reconnects, and yeah. So my question was, do you break the promise? And you said you break the connection. You break and the you connection, break the and breaking the connection breaks the promise. Yeah. No, so can you just break the promise and keep the connection? We don't do that. We uh, the, okay. well, I I I don't have any sensible way. It, it's there. I think that's a I think that that's a conversation for another time. But the answer is. We wouldn't be doing things that way. Yeah, I, I have sort of thought about designs for a sort of next generation iteration on CAPTP with looser ordering requirements. It, it's another protocol, though, and it's not something that, like, it's, you're no longer standardizing CAPTP. You're designing a new thing. Um, I'd love to find out what CAPT UDP looks like, but uh, um, yeah, that's that's for another time. Um, yeah. Because you mentioned wanting to free up resources, let me also ask, at this level or at this stage, what are we trying to achieve or not with regard to garbage collection? Um, so Cam Proto just does ref counting. Um, you know, Christine has been calling it distributed acyclic garbage collection. I think that is the right solution. I actually like I suppose in principle, I'm open to collecting cycles, but I would first want to see a design that doesn't add much complexity, which I don't expect anyone to come up with. And it also gets weird because we have implementations in C++ and Rust, which don't even have garbage collectors as such. So ref counting is really kind of the only thing they can do. Um, I think for simplicity alone argues for not doing more than that. So, no, we have two minutes left in the hour. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say that distributed acyclic GC and distributed GC and all those types of things. Yes, the current stuff uh, assumes distributed acyclic GC. I know there's been more recent developments in thinking about distributed acyclic GC again, and that there are also the um, information from electric communities on uh, distributed uh, cyclic GC is something we'll be re-exploring soon, um, especially with hopefully uh, uh, the... Well, I'm not going to say that on this recording, uh, but the, but the, the, yes, this is something we should come back to, but um, I'm going to throw this back over to Jessica because we have one minute left and Jessica is also the chair. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I don't want to run on. Uh, I, I, I'm sure there's more discussion to be had. Um, my plan is to create an issue on the GitHub with uh, the link to re the recording and I'll upload the slides. Uh, and of course the minutes will be available in the coming day or two. Um, and I encourage everyone to participate on that. 
issue. Uh, if if people have more discussion to be had there, and other people who couldn't attend today, hopefully will uh, participate there too. Um, and unless anyone has something very urgent, uh, I guess I'll just say that um, I'll get a poll up very soon for the date. I know there were some proposals about just setting the date in this meeting, but we're running on, and I think some people couldn't attend the proposed date. Uh, so I'll just make well, a can poll. Can we pray for two meeting. minutes to set a date between the three cut parties? What? Uh, it's really. You know, it cost us a week last time when we didn't manage to do it real in, you know, with the parties here and their calendars open. Um. So first of all, I'm going to stop this recording before we have any discussion about that. Um. Could I say thank you, Jessica, for the awesome presentation? Can we get a round of applause for Jessica? <laughs> really, really incredible stuff. Especially Jessica only started getting trained on this stuff uh, probably about six months ago and has taken the leadership on the cap uh, all of the OCAP and stuff internally and uh, um, has done just really a wildly incredible job. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted. All right, stopping the recording now.